the first thing I want you to do is I'd like you to take a sip of that glass of water because we're going to be talking about health today and health can often seem like a complicated target that we're trying to achieve but it can be as simple as taking one more sip of a glass of water. Um, we all know that there are targets that we should be achieving with regards to the quantity of water we, eat, we drink every day but one more sip takes us there and fluid um, health can be such a fluid target to achieve that sometimes we want to focus on simple steps to take us a little further ahead towards our goals and that's really what we're going to be talking about when it comes to osteopathy um, so small steps towards a big change because our systems need that 70 percent worth of we, we are 70% water and we need to constantly integrate water back into our system in order so that we can complete the functions that we need to every day in the, in the way that we have to. So we all have one more thing in common today, other than the fact we've all just had a sip of water. We're all living, hopefully. <laughs> and um, there are certain fundamentals that define us as living organisms. One that we can move, one that we respire and breathe, one that we metabolize and digest, we, we have certain behaviors and we reproduce, we have circulatory systems, we have heart and, and, and have a circulatory system pumping, pumping blood around our body, and the final is neural integration, we have a brain and spinal cord receiving and giving feeding information into the rest of the body to allow us to perform the goals and mechanisms that we need to. So we we'll just cover just a couple of those important ones would be respiration. We're constantly taking oxygen from the environment around us and absorbing it through our lungs into our system so that our bodies can perform the complica compli complicated chemical and physiological processes that are necessary for us to be alive. And that's sustained by movement of the rib cage, creating a reduced pressure within the lungs so that oxygen can flood in and then a relaxation of that rib cage so that the oxygen can, can move out of the lungs. And then we have digestion and metabolism. And so in this situation, we're taking the nutrients from the food that we've chosen to consume and the water we've chosen to consume and breaking them down chemically using the stomach acid and enzymes within our body or mechanically when we chew, when we're eating a sandwich and we're breaking down the particles of food by chewing. Um, but then our bodies also perform a mechanical digestive process when the colon creates a massaging movement to the food as it's passing through our system. Um, and then as all of that food gets broken down and the fluids, we're able to break down them into smaller and smaller constitutional parts and then produce energy out of them using the oxygen that we've taken in and sustain our lives. And then finally, the way that I've kind of organized this slide is that movement is vital for all of those factors to be able to exist. So our bodies are constantly taking stimuli from the environment around us, taste, smell, um, temperature receptors, we're hearing and visually taking responses from the environment around us and then immediately integrating that and producing a response that generally is a, a form of movement. So if the temperature suddenly dropped in this room, you wouldn't need to read a thermostat to know that. You'd be able to tell that the temperature had dropped and put on a cardigan or a jacket or something like that and make a responsive movement towards it. If there was a loud bang outside of this room, based on your previous response and previous experience of noise, you might be able to make a judgment call about whether or not you should move towards that noise and see if somebody needs some help or if you should run away from it. And so we're constantly using a neurological system to create movement and change from the world around us so that we can interact with our system and interrelate with it. Um, yeah. So. We can all give ourselves a pat on the back because we're amazing and we're doing all of this without even thinking about it at this point in time. Just sitting here, our bodies are striving for health without us having to really focus too much energy on thinking about it. We're repairing muscle tissue, we're laying down new bone and increasing bone density and we're filtrating blood just to name but a few things. And all we really need to do is think about that and understand it sometimes and make good choices, small choices sometimes, like just taking an extra sip of water and aiming towards health to facilitate that health and improve upon it. And all of those things can be very simple changes. So, when our patients come into the, con into the clinic, 
often they'll talk about the fact that they find health to be confusing. They're in a, um, they, they've come because they want to have some questions answered. Something's happened to their health. Maybe it be that they're in, in pain, um, but they feel disengaged by their health and they're looking for help to find that health again. Moving back towards it. Um, so we obviously think of health as if it's a target, but really health is a fluid concept and it, it is constantly changing depending upon the time of year and what we're up to. So a change in occupation may affect our health. If we increase the amount of time we're sitting in a car or sitting at work, it's going to change our health. If it's tax season and we're an accountant, we're going to be spending more time sitting and we might suffer health-wise for that. Seasonal change, like in the winter time, we're less likely to spend time outside. In the summertime, we'll spend more time outside moving. Hormonal changes, whether it be menopause or pregnancy. Any other lifestyle factors and increase in activity if it's golf season or gardening season or maybe we're a 5k runner and we want to become a 10k runner or maybe we're dealing with a chronic illness like a cancer or an autoimmune disease maybe we're dealing with something more acute that means that we're spending less time being able to be mobile and, and our health suffers for it so how do we know when we've reached health if it's a we you know if it's a fluid concept well, we have lots of tools and statistics and investigations and ranges and spectrums that we use to help um, quantify health, but it's an accumulation of an entire living organism. So if our cholesterol levels are really good, but our sense of well-being is poor because we're being bullied at work, then our sense of well-being will be reduced. And does that still mean that we should feel healthy? Um, because it's a fluid target, we might not. So in our complicated lives, we often struggle to identify with health, but there are tools that we can use to help us understand it better, help us with our education to work towards it. So health as a definition is a complete state of physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease. Our health is not defined by the fact that we don't have something wrong with us, it's defined by how we feel about the other states within our health. And that's a World Health Organization quote. So one of the things we can use to help us gain, get ourselves back towards where we want to be within the spectrum of health is, would be a tool and osteopathy is a tool that we can use to get ourselves there. We can use the education and support that's provided by an osteopath to help us return to where we want to be with our health and facilitate a better state of health. So my story, um, I'm obviously not from Nova Scotia as you can tell by my accent <laughs> and as you know. Um, I'm originally from the UK and I was always interested in sciences um, at school but I had an accident that led me to need the help from, a, help from an osteopath and I was absolutely fascinated by the osteopath's ability to use a logical pattern of thought and deduction from his education and his experience to come up with a plan and he involved me in that plan the whole way through um, my treatment process. And then he used his hands to achieve the change that we, that we needed. And that to me was mind blowing. Um, so I decided that I would follow through and, and become more interested in osteopathy. And I volunteered at, at the practice for a while um, after school, helping out with paperwork and things like that. And then I decided that I would go and study osteopathy formally at a full time education, like um, all of us did, all of us chose to do. Um, and once I completed that education, I realized as part of osteopathy that it was really important that my lifestyle matched the type of uh, work that I was trying to achieve with my patients as well. And that was that I needed to find a lifestyle that made me happy. Hence my choice to move to Canada. And my mum's Canadian, so I'd had many happy holidays here and so we I ended up here in Canada. I think as a teenager, the great flavored candy and country music helped a little bit as well to make that choice. So really, I was looking for the balance within my lifestyle to bring me here. The founder of osteopathy was a gentleman called Andrew Taylor Still, who was a licensed medical doctor in 1854, serving um, in the American Civil War. But in 1864, three of his family members tragically died to meningitis, and it made him start to reconsider how he was thinking about the human body and how the human body worked. Um, at that point in time, the way that medicine thought about how the human body worked was that the systems worked in isolation. We weren't of the, the common medical opinion was not that the systems worked diversely and interacted with each other. So he spent 10 years restudying 
medicine and anatomy and physiology and studying with cadavers. And in 1874, he revealed the principles of osteopathy. Um, and from there, he opened the first school of osteopathy in 1892. So his philosophy was that um, we were to embrace the concept of each living organism um, being holistic and that the anatomy of the organism defined the function and the function defined the anatomy. So the structure and function were interrelated. He developed a form of hands-on treatment called osteopathy and recognized that we were constantly striving for health and that all the osteopath needed to do was help and facilitate that process to help the body return back to health. Um, when we're looking at the relationship between structure and function or anatomy and physiology. One of my favorite kind of areas of the body to talk about are feet. And uh, the shape and alignment of the bones, the bone density within the foot, where the ligaments attach onto, where the muscles attach onto, where the bursas are within the foot, defines how the foot can function or how the foot can work. And ultimately defines the function foot as a spring-like mechanism. Um, and so that, you know, that's just a little example of the, you know, structure and function being interrelated with one another. So there were four principles for Andrew Taylor still defining osteopathy. And the first one was that the body acts as a unit. We should consider the body as a whole, a diverse, interactive, multiple systems working together for the greater goal of health and life that we want to make sure that we're treating the patient and not the problem, not the symptom, and help heighten the patient's health and body awareness. So going back to those fundamentals of us talking about the different factors that affect our health and our wellness, any change in occupation or change in work for each patient that comes in, we want to consider. We want to consider the stress factors that might be playing upon somebody when they come into the clinic. Are they having any uh, stress factors with their family, friends, or at work, or financial issues? What's their activity level been like? What age are they at? What hormonal status are they at? Are they on any medications? And what's their full medical history that's brought them to us on, on the day that they've chosen to come? The second is that the body possesses its own self-healing, self-regulatory mechanism. Its ability to defend, repair, and remodel itself when, um, when the body's aging and, and undergoing tissue damage. That we're able to provide a stable internal environment whilst confronted by an ever-changing external environment, whether it be temperature or, or injury in some way. Any failure in that means that there's abnormal function or disease. So examples of that would be that we're able to maintain our blood glucose level. So just because I didn't eat my breakfast this morning doesn't mean that I'm about to kind of collapse right here in front of you. My body is able to maintain my blood sugar levels and my energy levels so that I'm able to sustain my life. Um, if I haven't had anything to drink for the last six hours, my body is able to maintain my fluid levels so that I don't become acutely dehydrated quickly. If I'm hot, I'm going to sweat to cool myself down. If I'm cool, I'm going to shiver to burn energy to heat myself back up. And hormones and antibodies help in that process as well. A structural homeostasis that we could consider is if we sprained our ankle and we wanted to um, avoid placing weight on that foot, we're going to deviate our, our weight onto, onto the other standing leg so that we can create a little bit more balance and allow that ankle to heal. So our body's constantly striving for repair and it's constantly striving for a homeostasis within that. And then back to our structure and function is our third one. They're interrelated and back to our foot. The, the way that the foot is, is designed is allowing for shock absorption from the body weight above or anything else that I add to my body weight above if I'm carrying a backpack or if I'm moving in an interesting way or standing on one leg. But the foot is also designed to be able to compensate for changes in terrain beneath it. Um, and so the, the body has evolved to be able to handle the different functions that we might play upon it on a daily basis. Another great example is the rib cage. The ribs attach. Thank you. <laughs> the ribs attach onto the front of the sternum and onto the back of the spine, and are mobile at each adjoinment process. There are muscles between each of the ribs that allows for the ribs to fully flare and expand, and then the diaphragm beneath pulls down and allows for the whole cage to expand so that the volume 
the um, air pressure within the rib cage is lower, so we get the air within. But if we have poor rib function and the ribs become restricted, then the function and the outcome of the amount of oxygen that we can take in at one in one breath is becomes reduced. So we spend lots of time sitting, then our ability to circulate air is going to be reduced as well. So structure and function are, are always to be considered and always interrelated with each other. So we want to make sure that we're functioning at the best of our ability. And the final principle is that the rationale for therapy, so when we place our hands on somebody, when we consider treating them, is based on the consideration of the principles above. We have to consider all of the principles in order for treatment to be appropriate. So we treat with our hands on, connecting with you as each as an individual, as a unique person, considering everybody as an individual. We treat the whole body and not isolate to one area. So if you come in with a knee problem, um, and I'm going to um, talk about Alexander Bellevue right now, so he's this fantastic moguls uh, skier. Um, if he was to come in with a knee problem, I would consider whether or not it was an acute issue where he'd he'd recently hurt himself, or has it been an accumulation of issues that have led him to come and see me at this point in time? So what's, what's his medical history? We're going to fully assess that knee. We're going to consider all previous injuries, any legged fractures, any change in sports equipment or footwear that he's been wearing, any previous hip degeneration or low back issues. Any of the structures around that knee can affect how that knee is asked to perform and therefore the outcome of how it can function. So. Um, so it means that we're able to consider both chronic and acute issues. The aim of treatment is always to assist in helping the body with its innate drive towards health. It's trying to facilitate and balance itself anyway. It's trying to help with its own health and um, repair itself. So we just need to help it along a little bit sometimes. This is one of my favorite quotes. Oops. That an osteopath's vocation to be, should be to find health that anybody can find disease. So it again goes back to um, the fact that we don't want to cover up symptoms. We want to eliminate them and find the starting problem. So again, back to that knee, we could cover it up with a knee brace and we could cover it up with anti-inflammatories or we could find the starting cause to the problem and fix that. So our goals are always to treat with our hands, hands on treatment, to reconnect each person with their health and understanding, and that takes some education and, and conversation. We want to address the patient as a whole and help the patient restore optimal function between their different systems. We want to enhance homeostasis and improve posture and balance as well. And it's help assist the patient uh, restore the, their capacity for health. So we're able to treat both chronic and acute injuries. And treatment can either be direct or indirect. So we can use, we're using manual treatment, hands-on treatment. We can soft tissue, stretch. We can use articulation and exercises. And if we're using direct treatment, we're going to engage a tissue and move past a restriction to create a point of ease. If we're using indirect treatment, then we're going to disengage the tissue so we can create a release and improvement in quality of movement. We can use both types of techniques when we're treating, plus lifestyle adaptations, and that creates the change that we're looking for, restoring the capacity for health. So what we want is we want for everybody to be able to be mobile. It's a human characteristic. It's a fundamental of living. We talked about that at the beginning. But there's no uniformity of movement in life. There are three major planes of movement, but three major planes of movement existing at every level within our body. So our capacity for mobility is vast. Um, it's unbelievable. So I can rotate my head over my shoulder by rotating with my neck, but if I then involve my rib cage and my low back, my ability for rotation is, is vast. The problem is, though, that in our daily lives, we don't often move within that full capacity. We become restrictive because we function within a limited range because we complete similar tasks every day. We don't necessarily take that full range of movement uh, through the quality of movement that we could every day. Um, so another, a good example of this would be um, what happens if uh, somebody ends up living in a nursing home. Either because of lack of stimuli or because of pain, they're going to spend a lot of time sitting. And if we sit for long periods of time and our spine doesn't consistently move and stretch and side bend, 
then we're not going to see as much movement going through our bowel. And what happens when the bowel has less movement going through it is that it becomes stagnant and then the potential for constipation can exist. So that's quite a common finding within, finding within elderly people within a nursing home. And then the other would be something I covered briefly a little while ago, and that's that if the rib cage becomes restricted because we spend a lot of time sitting and we're not going through the full lung and volume capacity that we can, there's always a potential for developing a lung infection and pneumonia. And that's a, quite a common finding as well. So movement is essential to life. Um, and that's what we're looking for when we're trying to make sure that we're restoring your capacity back to health. But movement and support are, are vitally interrelated with each other. And for support, we need strong, intelligent muscles. We need a neurological system that's giving really intelligent feedback and supporting the muscular system, skeletal system with good information so that the muscles can make the right decisions to move and contract with the right contraction value. Support and stability are interrelated and the stability that we need to act against gravity when we're moving around. Um, so we haven't been moving for a while, so I'm going to get you standing up. <laughs> standing up. And what we're going to do is, uh, I don't want you to take one foot off the ground completely, but I just want you to deviate some of your body weight over into one leg and slowly just lift one foot away from the ground a little bit. Just give yourself a kickstand to kind of balance with. What your bodies are doing right now is they're perceiving the movement from the stretch receptors and pressure sensors in your feet and they're establishing what it's going to take in order to stabilize you on that one foot. The more times you practice this, the better you get at it. And it's something that we don't always, we don't carry out every day. So our ability to perceive how we should control movement and stabilize ourselves is limited to how active we are. And the problem comes with when we choose to perform an activity that we haven't done for a while, it leaves us susceptible to injury. So you can all sit down now. But there's something nice to practice at home, is to kind of practice teasing your neurological system to ask it to perform to, for balance for you and stability. An infant does this when they're learning how to walk. Um, they're constantly testing into the bar barriers of balance and, and testing their system and getting their neurological system giving, giving more feedback to give the muscles the right, quite, right answers to tell them what to do. Um, but if we strap an infant in a car seat for long periods of time, or we make them sit for long periods of time without allowing them the capacity for movement, then they become delayed in the ability to move and stabilize movement correctly. And the same said for us if we sit in cars for long times or we sit in chairs for long time. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to encourage my patients to spend some time every day barefoot, um, re-establishing how their bodies perceive weight through their feet with the stretch receptors and pressure sensors and the best way to do that is to be barefoot and it can help with limiting kind of injury if the body knows how to perceive movement through the feet. One of the other things that we talk a lot about at the clinic is posture. It's very dependent upon lifestyle. Um, so if we have an office job and we spend lots of time sitting or we spend lots of time in the car then our hip flexors are going to be tight because they sit in a shortened state when we sit down and that will affect how the low back can function and how the rib cage can function and therefore how much strain we place into our neck and shoulders. So when we're looking at somebody we really want to make sure that we're making sense of how they're compensating for the environment around them. We always want to find that starting point. So with all of that in mind what can we fix? Well, if we're considering how the whole person works together as a whole, then we can work on back, neck, shoulders, the extremities, the arms, legs, elbows, fingers, thumbs, sometimes would come in, pelvis and hips. If somebody was to come in with a left shoulder problem, I would consider how that left shoulder interacted with the rest of the body and it attaches on through the rib cage. So perhaps we might be looking at an issue that's stemming from a problem with the rib cage or the back. The shoulder gets most of its support from the pelvis and the hips and the large muscular support that comes up from there. So is it that we're dealing with actually a chronic hip issue or a degenerative hip that's pre presenting as a shoulder problem and somebody's coming in because they're starting to notice that they're not able to move their arm into certain positions. But the shoulder is going to affect other areas. The shoulder is going to affect the lymphatic drainage from the arm and it's going to affect how the ribs can perform and therefore how our capacity for breath again. But it might also affect how the elbow and the wrist can perform and the hand functions as well. So, 
we're able to treat anybody. Um, we're considering each person as an individual and a unique life. Um, there are red flags that we know exempt certain people from certain treatments in, in certain ways. But as trained professionals from medical education backgrounds, from regulated educational backgrounds, we're trained to know when those red flags show up and what we need to do with regards to the type of referral that we need to make in order to make sure that the patient's getting the best quality healthcare they can. We want to make sure that everybody has the capacity to live their life the way that they want to, that they have positive relationships with their families and friends and children, not masked by pain. The pets, any sport, if they're engaged in sport in the way that they want to be, limit, not limited by injury, that they can take the vacation that they want to and enjoy the vacation that they want to. They can walk around Paris for four days without having the foot pain that they've had for six months previous. That they can enjoy the retirement and the future that, that they want to in the way that they want to as well. And rather than thinking about maintenance, we want to educate towards finding a solution. And we can do that by providing education towards the patient and support them with treatment and support them with the care that they require. So at the first visit, everybody receives a full case history so we can understand how unique you are. We can observe certain movements actively. We'll get you to perform certain active movements and see how you're performing them, with, with what quality you're performing them. And we'll perform passive movements too. We'll do certain orthopaedic tests so that we can see how you're able to move under, under a passive movement without your muscles being involved. And then once we've established that full kind of global understanding of how you move, then if it's appropriate, we'll treat. Um, and then involve you in a treatment plan and discussion afterwards as to how we're going to care for you best. So all of the osteopaths at Maritime Osteopathy, we all come from a regulated background of education, a regulated profession in Australia and in the UK, where we come from. Um, we travel around the world consistently in order to be able to update our education and be the best osteopaths that we can be. And we're supported by the referral system of the medical doctors and the OBS unit um, and public health and many other health professionals within, the, within our community supporting us with referral systems. So that means that we're able to treat sports injuries, pregnancy, we're able to treat children and baby and ourselves as adults and the care of the elderly as well. So I want to thank you for your time today and listening to me. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer them.